That's my philosophy when I work with people is, is allowing them to have the space and freedom to explore them themselves from a career perspective and say, well, who am I now? Because I may have been that person before. Who am I now? What is out there that interests me or that I could be drawn to? And then really working with that and um, exploring that. So that's a joy for me. It's a really real, a real privilege to work with people closely doing that. Rebuilding a career after 50 or after serious illness such as cancer is a confronting reality for many. My guest today around my warm table is Lois K. Smith, a Churchill Fellow and a career practitioner whose greatest professional joy is to connect these particular groups of people with their innate skills and help them find their next. Sonia Nolan is my name and you are very welcome here at My Warm Table, an Australian podcast of smart conversations with heart, inspired by my Italian heritage and the concept of a tavola calda, a warm and welcoming table where curiosity, acceptance and big ideas feed not just your stomach, but also your mind and soul. Lois, welcome to My Warm Table. Hi, Sonia. Thank you for having me. Oh, gosh. Lois, we've crossed paths a number of times over the years, and often there are times where you've been able to help me through tricky transitions (laughs) or to consider what the next step is. And I know that that's something that you do as part of your professional offering. That's right. There's also a lot more that you do, and I'm really (laughs) looking forward to exploring that today around, um, around my warm table. Wonderful. Thank you, Sonia. Looking forward to it. So let's start by talking about tricky transitions and what your work involves like you are a a wisdom career coach (laughs) how do you describe yourself to people it's actually quite tricky to describe myself because the profession has evolved over time and it's my 16th year actually as I call myself a career counsellor a lot of the vernacular around career coaching sometimes means job coaching as and and as well as career coaching so it can get a bit confusing at times um the proper term is career development practitioner Ooh, that's a bit of a mouthful it is a bit of a mouthful and people don't always know what that is either no so I tend to say to people that I help help you navigate often it is tricky transitions it's helping you navigate through your career and what I like to term your life work mm. so maybe rather than your work life put the life ever first and then put the work after it is a better better option I like that because that also gives that feeling that your life's work has got some meaning and purpose and that it's values driven so and I think that that sits really really comfortably with the way that you like to look at things but I like that your life's work yeah it's even um life work and then life's work exactly yeah Yeah, there's there's lots of um permutations of that so I like playing in that space but I think the tricky transitions I think I did one first actually I think that's where I came across the term I was in um corporate relations and in um superannuation And I decided after two years of reading about 20 books that I would become this notional career counsellor. So I went back to school and did a master's degree in career development. And then I decided I would hand back the the corporate fuel card and the company car and the laptop. All all the cons, all the, the, not the cons, the mod cons. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And the salary, I must add there, probably is important. And the super. And, um, And actually try my bit as a as a career counsellor practitioner in private practice. So I was later told, wow, you've changed career, like you've changed your career direction from being in financial services to career development. And you've also changed your mode from employment to self-employment. And yeah. that, that was pretty big. But fortunately, I wasn't too aware of that at the time. I was, but I wasn't too sort of worried about that because I really was so passionate about what I was learning. Mm. So I did that. But very soon I found I had a few clients, but it was a little bit slow and they were mainly from the financial financial services area because they were the people who knew me most at that time. And I actually ended up working at a local drop-in centre in Midland called Employment Directions or Midland Job Link as it was called then. And Employment Directions was the branding. And that was amazing. It was like being paid to learn in a lot of ways because I had people who, women who were going back into work that wanted to work on the mines right. and they come in and say, oh, here's my resume. And they'd have like sewing and macrame written on their resume as yeah. their interest. And I said, that's okay, but we need to maybe beef this up a little bit, you know, because you're going to be up on a mine site. So we had lots of fun people who'd lost their job, unfortunately, and also young people who 
um, I'd be asked to work with who were sometimes at risk. So it was really eclectic and it was a little bit scary at times because I was new to it, but I really enjoyed it. And from that, that was a springboard into working with the Western Force. So that was my uh, sport foray into career development. So I've been really fortunate. I've been, had this career, career, um, a career, work, career, a career, I like career. That too. Yeah. but working with a really diverse group of people. So athletes, mm-hmm. I'm not sporty, I'm dancey. Yeah. So I um, somehow managed to get myself in there working with the athletes and that was an amazing experience working I still work with elite athletes actually with the Institute of Sport as well so helping them in their career transitions after they finish their elite sporting careers yeah that as well as even recognizing that can't just be like oh suddenly I'm I'm finishing up my sporting career oh wow what am I going to do now you do hope they've actually thought about it because they do know that that end is inevitable at some point. Sure. But that's, I always, used to always say that role was more marketing than it was actually career development because you had to always be talking about that, but without gloom and doom around it, but like, hey, what are you doing? What, you know, let's have a look at this and you sort of control them along a little bit sometimes or it's make inter- it interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think perhaps some of the a common thinking about elite sports is that they all end up in the media. They all end up as commentators <laughs> on the media, which is something that we see a lot. Yeah. But obviously there's a lot more behind that and many, many paths other than the media. Oh, definitely, yeah. And and that's often the, you know, the marquee players and the famous players who maybe get a sponsorship deal or those sorts of things. And then there's everybody else. It's the 80-20 rule applies sure. pretty much everywhere and there as well. So definitely that was a really great experience. Working with young people, you know, there's always been a joy for me. I have done a few not-for-profit roles over time. So I was a state manager of a mentoring program with corporates and then young people and and getting them sort of uh, working together and discovering about different careers because that's sometimes the problem. People ring me up sometimes and say, I just want to know what's out there. Mm. And I think uh-huh. there's a lot out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's so frightening though, isn't it? It's just, you know, especially mm-hmm. if you've had what, you know, what is known as, I guess, a linear career mm-hmm. that you've gone straight out of school yeah. into a an internship and you've stayed in the same company for a really long time or you've stayed in exactly the same sort of role or profession across different companies, but you haven't necessarily ventured out of those those streams. It's really scary to think about doing something very different for a lot of people. It is. And most of my clients these days are, I'd say, mid-life professional, career, career professionals, and they either are just fed up with what they're doing or it doesn't fill them up anymore. The meaning and purpose is really important, as you said before, when we were talking about life's work. And they just, yeah, don't quite know. They don't know what's out there, yeah. but they also don't know what's in here. And I'm kind of pointing in, inward yeah, at ourselves here. Them. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that's my philosophy when I work with people is is allowing them to have the space and freedom to explore them themselves from a career pers- perspective and say, well, who am I now? Because I may have been that person before. Who am I now? What is out there that interests me or that I could be drawn to and then really working with that and um, exploring that. So that's a joy for me. It's a really real, a real privilege to work with people closely doing that. Well, it, it, I can see the joy that you have in that and I've seen mm-hmm. that over the years, Lois, and, and that real warmth and empathy that you bring to your role as well because that's really important as people are going into, it, I guess, an inward journey to really work out what is going to align with who they've become yes. as a mature adult as opposed to a graduate, which is where they might have started their career. That's right. Yeah, they're still discovering themselves in that process. Yeah. And it's also not just who they are now, and it's also, of course, who they want to become. So yes. it's, it's quite. it can be quite transformational for some people. It can be a little bit transactional for others. It's just like, I'm here and I need to get over there. Let's look at some tactics. But for those who want to do the deep dive, that, that's fun work. Yep. Yeah. And it's also, of course, the environment has changed. You know, at mm-hmm. the world of work, my goodness, it's had an enormous transformation just in the last couple of years with, with what COVID has done to the workplace. Yes. But also the world of work has changed with technology and, uh, you know, you name it, and the world of work has changed. And, and, and there are statistics I know sort of raising children and going to all of those high school talks and they keep talking talking about the future world of work and what the future work looks like and there's there's all of these jobs that haven't been created yet and you, you yeah. keep hearing all of this sort of rhetoric which is actually really the environment we're living in now That's but right. the world of work has changed and potentially if you haven't kept up your skills or you don't have those skills again it, it's really quite confronting. Yeah it sure can be and people have to look beyond 
the traditional realms of, you know, necessarily out of school and then into TAFE or into uni or, or those sorts of things. I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for trying out being an entrepreneur, mm. um, working at different jobs, mixing up the modes. So again, you know, some casual work, which unfortunately sometimes that's all you can that's get when you leave get. school or leave uni. But in some ways it allows you to dip your toe in the water early. There's nothing wrong with locking into a linear career if that's really what you want to do. I think I was surprised early in my career practitioner journey when I'd have people say, oh, I'm a lawyer. I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. And I'd say, oh, when did you realise that? And they'd say second semester. Oh, gosh. Yes. And that wasn't only once I heard that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and other professions. So professions yeah. sometimes where it's about maybe pleasing, you know, parents expectations of parents or, or themselves. Or yes. where you think your, li- your li- road is supposed to go. Exactly. Yeah. And, and sometimes those people are derailed by redundancy and it's never, oh, wow, this is a great thing that's happened. But later on, they often come back and say, wow, you Thank know, goodness. yeah, it actually sort of made me wake up and look at myself or, or when we're doing the work together. And that's, of course, sponsored by a company when that happens often. Um, they say, I really wish I'd done some of this earlier because it's actually really good to look at this, you know, and look at this as deeply as we are. So it's interesting. I think we perhaps need to have some road, um, little stop signs along the roadway of our um, of our career and say maybe we stop and reflect. I, I certainly notice people up to the the big O birthdays, they tend to get yeah, in touch. Up yeah, up to 40 or 50 or 30. Yeah, yeah. How interesting. Absolutely. Well, you know, Lois, I've always said that, and it's probably completely inappropriate and not politically correct to say <laughs> this, but, you know, I've always said that as a woman I know that I had a natural realignment and uh, a natural choice to make to do something differently when I had children yes you know I I went on maternity leave and during that time I actually left the workplace I decided I was not going to go back and I was going to become self-employed and work around my children completely and my family so you know that was a choice I made and and it was sort of this natural moment in time for me to make it. And, and I've reflected often that for, for men, sometimes they, they don't have that sort of crossroad in life to make that choice yes. earlier. Yeah, that's right. I think that's changing a little. Mm. And I think Advent Opportunity Living, things like that helps. But certainly I've had a few younger men, you know, younger in their 30s, actually starting to say, actually, I want to be over there, mm. you know, and, and they, they do want to press pause and look at that. So that's encouraging. I think that's really encouraging. But definitely there's a natural, you know, when we talk about the tricky transitions before, I think becoming a parent is a tricky transition sure in many is. ways. Yeah. Um, but it certainly makes you look at your career. And, and, and I actually, actually, I really enjoyed my work. I was working at the Stock Exchange, actually, in corporate relations when I had my daughter, Sasha, and I took I think six months off and then I was going back part-time but it was just interesting that I I think I thought when I go back it'd all be oh this will be all new and different and it, and it was kind of the same and I'd really liked it but I'd been I'd, I'd been there a while by that stage and I was ready for a new challenge mm. so I think sometimes when people think oh you're having a child so you want something easy or yeah. passive or and it's and, the and then people looking down their nose sometimes at part-time work as if somehow it's lesser and then you're not invited to the meeting or you're not given any PD. I really rally against that because sometimes part-time people are the hardest working people you see. Oh, I've, I've absolutely known that in my career, yeah. for sure, for sure. And it's interesting, another thing, another conversation we were having just earlier, Lois, is, is the the resume and yes. the subtext to your resume. Yeah. And and I was sharing with you earlier that, you know, my LinkedIn profile or my resumes show that I've been here for two years and somewhere else for 18 months and another place for four years and, yep. you know, self-employed for 20 to- 22 years. <laughs> and, you know, so it's, it's, it's quite a an eclectic sort of representation of the yep. type of work that I've done. But the subtext to that where people say, oh, you have, yeah, there's not a lot of stability here, Sonia. You know, you haven't been at various places for very long. But the subtext to a CV uh, these days is, I think, much more interesting about a person than the actual roles that they've had. Yes, you know, absolutely. The, and it shows the, adaptability yeah. too. Well, so, you I know, think so. I, th- I think a lot of that is in the eye of the beholder. Yes. And I certainly noticed a shift from having been self-employed and then delving into some, I you had know, a state manager role and a few other um, manager roles along the way. I had a, quite a portfolio career for a while before being really fully, fully in, in my business full time. And 
I just noticed that people would look at the fact that I'd been self-employed maybe 10 or 15 years ago and go like, oh, she's self-employed, maybe she won't take direction or some some sort of I've thoughts heard like that, that. too. And yet yeah. then it seemed to turn and it was like, oh, good, well, you'll know all about this, this and this and you'll be able to, you know, run this operationally. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that there was just that understanding that to run a business is actually quite hard yes. and you need to really – push everything yourself and make sure you're really resilient and proactive and you need to be across a lot of things. So I think people recognise there's a lot of generalist skills that come from it and many, many transferable skills, mm. um, some that you really wish you didn't have. But <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But it does also come back to the hiring manager in yes, this case as does. well. And I think that that's, again, my experience is that someone looked at my resume and I was, you know, down to the last interviews and he says, oh, you look a bit scatty. And I just thought, wow, that's never a term I would ever have used about my career or my approach to professional contribution. But because I'd had so many different places in and out, it it, it looked to him who'd had a linear career for 40 years in one role or one organisation, it came across as not necessarily a serious contender. Sure. So so I think the hiring manager, yeah, Mm. sure, that's bias, but it's also the hiring manager a candidate, you need to be able to really sell yourself and your skills, your transferable skills and your your abilities and what all of those changes can contribute to that workplace. 100% agree. It is all about crafting the story mm. and and that's why there are wonderful people who love doing <laughs> that. I Funny, I come from corporate relations and I've done many, many a resume in my time working with my clients. Um, I now tend to more teach my clients how to do that and then I have some wonderful people who can help with the, with the writing and the crafting of the story. But I think LinkedIn plays a big part in that now because people will more readily go there to check you out. So that about section, some people may be not be aware that that's mm. a lot longer now than it used to be. It's almost an A4 page size of text and some people just have a really like a little short paragraph which you'd normally have at the top of a resume as a bit of an intro for yourself. But that about section, you can really expand on that tell a bit more of your story put it inject a bit of your personality into it tell them a little bit about what makes you tick and who you are so with your example Sonia you know weaving the story and the theme mm. um yes I've done lots of you know things yeah. in these different guises and this is what it's made this is how it's made me you know yeah. this and this and this so you know you can kind of kind of craft your story into yeah. into that about section uh- it like what we were saying earlier about the subtext of your CV. That might be the place where you can actually start injecting some of that. Yeah, yeah. great tip, yeah. Lois. Yeah, really good tip. LinkedIn's very powerful. And I, sometimes mm. I hear from younger people or you know parents who say that their young people aren't on LinkedIn or that they think, oh, is that worth it? And look, it's changing a lot and it's becoming a little – they're all becoming – the platforms are becoming a lot like each other. I sometimes don't know which one I'm on. Yeah, I've felt, um, I've felt that too. Yeah, there's a lot of the influencer influence coming through. Yes. But at, at the same time, that one is essential. You know, like if you're going to be yet yeah, wanting people to find you, you want to be findable on there. It's not just about splashing yourself around and and posting a lot. It's actually about being findable, so keywords and all of those things, and actually realising why am I on there, who do I want to attract. So that's, yeah, yeah important as well. Really good tips. And, in, in fact, um, in a, in another life I, I tutor at university level yes. and I have always told my students, please get on LinkedIn. Once the semester is over, connect with me. Don't connect with me during semester because <laughs> I can't alter your marks. <laughs> So after semester's over, yep. connect with me. And they're also a bit like, oh, I don't know, because we're only students. And I'm saying, but what you can actually do is start making your connections and start following the people or the organisations that you are interested in. Exactly. So that you've got a bit of an insight into when they're hiring, when the traineeships and the graduate programs come up. I said, you're actually looking at the moment. You're just learning. So yep. use LinkedIn as a really good tool for that. So yeah, That's I right. totally hear what you're saying. Yep. And in a candidate States market. It's also about employer branding. So the mm. companies that are on LinkedIn and using it really effectively, they look at who follows them and then they'll put out, oh, look, we, you know, we're doing an extra round of um, applications or something like that. They may only put it out to those people oh, um, or, yes. or advertise it there as their primary place. So yeah, employers are getting very savvy to a low cost way to find really good people quickly. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, there's a really good tip already. So <laughs> if you're not on LinkedIn, definitely get on there. If you are on there, have a little review of your about section and For perhaps sure. put a little bit more heart and soul and uh, personality <laughs> into that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Lois, I'd like to talk more about the transition after 50. Uh-huh. Because, yeah. <laughs> I am qualified to speak on this. Well, sadly, sadly. so am I. Sadly, <laughs> so am I qualified to speak on this. And I'm all ears listening because yeah. I I do know many friends and uh, work work colleagues who, you know, come to the, the, like you were saying, the big O birthdays. But I think something happens after 50 yeah. and it, it feels harder to get a job despite all the wisdom and yes. talents and skills and opportunities that you've had that you can bring to a workplace it feels harder it does it tell can, me it what can the reality do. is yeah and it's it's funny isn't it because we're in a market in not in all sectors and not in all industries but right now we're in a market that's quite advantageous to the candidate so age becomes less of an issue there because they really want someone and they want someone with skills and they want them now so that that's a good thing but I do remember a few years ago now probably before I was that prestigious age um I do remember a client who who was a little bit over 50 and she she had a really great background in comms and was trying to get into a particular industry and she was just finding that she was getting turned away because the hiring people were internal recruitment people were so young and they were just looking at her as if she was ancient (laughs) Which is horrifying. Of oh, look, I've, I've had that look. It's very, yeah, very yeah. Con- disconcerting. But even to the point where, and this this woman was award winning. She, you yeah. know, she was really good at her craft. Even to the point where she was asked, "Do you know how to turn a computer on? Do you know how to use a computer?" <gasps> really? Yeah. So, so I think I think we've got a lot of work to do. I think we've mm-hmm. been maybe the silent generation. We've just been head mm-hmm. down, you know, doing our work and, and, Gener- and generation X. We are totally the forgotten generation. Totally. So Don't it's even. Time. That's a whole other yeah, podcast. That is, that is another po- podcast, exactly. <laughs> but I think that's so. Part of the problem is maybe I hate to say it, but our own in terms of being able to articulate what we mm. have to offer. I am often working with people who are either changing their career direction or getting a new job, and they haven't ever interviewed, or they interviewed twenty years ago. Yes. So there's a lot of that kind of. Well, they would just know my skills, and that here's my resume, and they should just you know, no, no, you've actually got to you know be able to look at that and work out what you. It's not about you. It's about how you fit them and you've yes. got a lot of work to do there and and some people that's a bit of a revelation for them and others know that but they're just doing it well but finding the doors are closing on them because the company maybe wants to bring in someone younger that they can train up in their way there is the bias look I'm not going to say that doesn't exist but I think we also have to work on our own attitude as well and I think sometimes the the silver lining can be people who decide they want to have a bit more lifestyle. They may go portfolio. When I say that, it's a, a blend often of perhaps a contract or some part-time work that's solid and you get your super and you get your days off and all of that good stuff. It's your bread and butter. But also you may be consult and yeah. my silvers are coming through. You know, I can charge more apparently because I've got, you know, wisdom, silver it's wisdom. Tinsel. <laughs> exactly, silver tinsel or tinsel wisdom in my hair. So, you know, we, we joke about these things, but actually mm. we do have a lot of wisdom and we do mm. have a lot of things to offer and and so do young people. So everyone wherever they're at has to market their energy <laughs> and their contribution and and the good stuff about them and sometimes that's hard to do for yourself so often when I'm working with people they're like oh wow I didn't realize I had that oh that's right you know so sometimes we're our own worst enemy when it comes to thinking about how we'll present ourselves to the marketplace but also what we can do and not just saying oh I couldn't do that I'm you know too old or I wouldn't be able to learn that it's amazing what we can learn. My dad in his 70s learned how to tile a small piece in the in the bathroom because no one would come and quote for oh, him. Is that so and it? I said, just go on YouTube, Dad. And he and did and he learned it. how to do it. Mm. And you know, like we can all learn things if we really want to and we're motivated. It's so, that growth yeah. mindset, isn't it? it Which absolutely is the is. most important yes. in any candidate that you're looking for. Actually having somebody who is willing to try yeah. and give something a go is absolutely. really important. Yeah, mm. absolutely. But I think it's also, it's definitely about employers opening their mind yeah. to, I'd really like to see more job share. And yes. that could be a person who's got a young family, you know, has come back from parental leave, wants to do the two or three days with someone who's maybe 60-ish or whatever, it doesn't matter what age, but yeah. like but 
got different reasons for maybe wanting flexibility. I certainly, many of my friends are self-employed and most of them actually hand on heart say they are unemployable because they've enjoyed being self-employed for so long. They've got the flexibility and the freedom that they actually don't think they could kind of, you know, go in and be told, you know, you can't have this break at this time or you can't have that holiday or whatever. So that's a funny thing to consider. But what I do enjoy, I'm I'm kind of getting back to the life dash work Mm. That side of things, of really work-life balance is what it used to be called, but I'm calling it life work because you're putting life first. And certainly for me, you know, I've had a, some health challenges that I never, never expected because we all just think we're going to be super healthy forever. For sure. um, yeah. And it's a bit of a shock to us. So I know I've definitely, for me, I've gone back to my dancing. That's my passion. And I actually put in my week, right, I've got that class and that class. And, yes, you and then prioritise according to what is really important to you. Yeah, and I can fit everything else around yeah. it. Unfortunately, sometimes some of my clients, they're professionals, they're working, they can't always work daytime hours with me. So we work over Zoom and, and that can be early evening. So it yeah. all works well, you know. So I think I think many of us, and I say that from younger people right up to um, more mature people, yes. is that we want flexibility and we yeah. want a bit more control all over our life and we're still going to give 150% or 110% or however many percentages we want to give energy wise to our work but we just want to be able to call the shots a bit on how that looks and employers are realizing that of course aren't aren't they at the moment. I think that obviously COVID has certainly given them a real shot in the arm in regards to embracing flexibility and embracing you know a different type of contribution from people based on you know where they're at and what they can give because gosh all those parents who had to homeschool during COVID as well as try and contribute professionally I absolutely think they all deserve a medal because that is hard that is hard (laughs) at the best of times so you know we've all had to really adapt and do things very differently that we could never have foreseen a few years ago so the leaps and bounds we've made in in technology and, and embracing that remote work, I think is a really positive thing for this Huge. life work. Yeah. Uh, I do sort of still wonder about how productivity works in that in some instances. Yeah, I think that's very personal. And, yes. and when I work with people around, we call it almost like their work ingredients, if we were mate, bringing in the cooking now. Oh, yes, let's go. If we My were making table, a soup, yes. which is one thing I can cook, I'm not a very good cook, but I can make a soup, is, you know, there's lots of ingredients that are going into that pot. And I think that's the thing is that some people say, oh, I like to be in a loud and fun environment. That's how I buy. That's how I work. That's how I enjoy my work and get my creativity. And others just completely hate it. I've had clients where we've said, okay, you're in an open office, just cannot work like that. Can you get some noise cancelling headphones and just take them off and have a quick chat at the water cooler, but then put them on. And do your, you yeah, know, it's yeah. almost like working out how can you survive, not just thrive, but even you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's for, it's survival of them in that place, which is a shame. But yeah, it, it's about people creating that environment for themselves, and I think. A lot of people are talking now about the hybrid, you know, working from yes. home if they can, and obviously not all industries no, can do that. No, but course. if they can, um, having if- a bit of a variety to their to their week. Yes, yeah, for sure. I I think there's also this element, and I I spoke to someone recently about neurodiversity and, and in fact, saw a post on LinkedIn just this morning about a a woman whose husband was neurodiverse and and they were talking about the fact that there some people just need to work from home more and and that that is absolutely their best place to be productive. So it's embracing all of that, isn't it? For sure, absolutely. And it just isn't as cookie cutter. It's not like you all fit into these slots and and you will do it this way. It's kind of saying how is this going to work the best for everybody Mm. and you're going to have people that are really loyal and stay longer and, and advocate and bring other people into the business because they're trusted and their strengths and interests are utilized as well you know that I think that's a big part of it as well so it's a lot more job crafting I think Mm. we'll we'll hopefully see in the future I've worked with some neurodiverse clients and yeah it's it's a real privilege because it's that there's I always have the philosophy there is space for everybody to do something and it's finding out what they want to do it's it's finding out and sometimes creating it in the marketplace which can be a little bit challenging and yeah obviously with technology in the future of work which is really now mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and ever evolving it, it takes effort and mm-hmm. and companies need to be open to that and individuals need to be open to different ways of working and, and trying things out testing experimenting yep it's yeah. all the go 
I'd like to circle back to this idea of work after 50 uh-huh. and, and yes. the tricky transitions and what's next. Yeah. But but 50 and, and 50s and 60s, mm. so, so there are times in your life where you are um, – still in a position where you've got an enormous amount to contribute and want to contribute and have the energy and activity and potentially the financial need to Mm. contribute. It's also a time when uh, you might be challenged by having to care for ageing parents or potentially still have your children around to raise as well. The sandwich generation. The sandwich generation. (laughs) And, And also then something you alluded to earlier, you know, out of the blue, even though you're young and sprightly, there are these health challenges yeah. that confront you and yeah. things that you would never have expected that you need to deal with. So I'd love your insights mm. into how to manage the over 50 and 60 year old transitions and, and keeping a professional contribution yep. while trying to juggle all of those life experiences yeah. at the same time. Yeah, I, d- I definitely think it does come back to life work and, and the design of that wherever you can. But it is a tricky one. I think some people are listening and maybe have a, a corporate career or, you know, employed. Others have that portfolio or some are self-employed. So I think everyone comes with their different view on it. A great book is called The 100-Year Life. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. and and. I, I love that book because it actually talks about the fact that, yet, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, we can have health challenges at obviously any age, but they certainly st- start coming in in that, you know, that uh, half point, if you want to call it that, of the 100 year life, if that's, if you're lucky enough to get that, that many years. So, some points in the book there just raise the fact that we are generally living longer and there is so much help and medicine and all of the things that keep us younger longer. So, I, I tend to think a lot more people will want to work or elect to work longer and many will have to you know it's one of those things but I think when I'm working with people the hope is that they actually find something that they really enjoy doing get a lot of satisfaction from contribute to that they're not necessarily looking to draw a line in the sand and go fishing you know and I'm nothing against people that want to go fishing that's great if that's your passion well, what I've found, well, you know, from my limited experience and people who have retired, mm. they retire for maybe two years, have a, the best time. <laughs> They're all over Facebook with their grey nomad experiences or their overseas travels yes. and all of the things they've been saving up to do. And then they come back and they want to come back to the yeah. workplace and yep. in a part-time capacity. So it's almost like retirement was about doing those bucket list items. Yeah, absolutely. It can but be. once mm. they've been done, they're actually really craving that professional stimulation again. Yes. Yeah. And again, it comes back to values and, and things that people want to have in their work. And belonging is a huge one. Mm, and we know, you know we've talked about loneliness and other things mm. like that. So And that can come in even with the hybrid working model or working from home. Some people yeah. actually feel lonely. So I think that that's part of it as well. I'm all for more sort of sabbaticals and and yeah. shorter stints and really, as you were saying, Sonia, with your forays into different things. Yes. Um, um, my family we, we went off um, 13 years ago now. It's it's flown by, but we went for nearly six months overseas and went back to our homeland of Scotland mm. and went on the um the ch- the Channel Tunnel to Paris and then we just you know we mostly did train travel and um, went to a lot of a lot of different countries. So we did my husband's the cook in our family. So he did develop the Tuscan chicken when yes. we were in Tuscany. So oh, that's perhaps you can share that recipe with us. That's a very good recipe. I'll have to wrestle it out of him. Yes. Um But yeah, that that was amazing. So you know we did that and that was great and I actually visited some organizations I visited the um career transition for dancers in New York when I was there Mm -hmm. so I actually did a few little kind of visits and things along the way but that wasn't it was mainly just for fun but we did do a little bit of work as well because we were able to work we were called laptop nomads that's what we called ourselves (laughs) and they were really physically heavy big laptops that back back then 13 years ago yeah and Airbnb hadn't quite started so I'm amazed we actually used to just put into Google Wi-Fi, Tuscany, Villa, in, oh, in that order, you know, yeah. so that we'd get somewhere with good Wi-Fi so that we could still do some work. We didn't do a whole lot of work. Well, I didn't. <laughs> but, um, no, it was amazing. We just had an absolute ball. So I think doing things like that or think, saying I'm going to take some time off to say write your book or launch mm. your podcast or whatever it might yeah, be, you know, awesome. I think having more of that life work where you say this is my life, it's my one precious life it is. and what do I want to do with it people can 
ask for those breaks or make those breaks or even if it's a couple of months or six months. And I think sometimes that's maybe better than a big long stretch of, so. of trying out retirement and then yeah. saying, oh, actually, I want to go back now. It's There's nothing wrong with going back. No, there mm. isn't. And and it's being intentional about those breaks, isn't it? Yeah. And and really knowing that you need you want to be doing something a little bit different, but not I I I I'd always say never say never. Because exactly. never is a very big word. Yep. And you just don't know what's around the corner that's going to lead you down a path that you've been travelling yes. or want to travel or exactly. never thought you'd travel. Yep. Never say never. Mm. For sure. And actually even on that point, sometimes even going back to somewhere you've worked before, I'm seeing more of that. And I think Financial Review had an article around, they were calling it the boomerang employees, oh, right. but I tend to call it the rise of the returnee. Oh. And I think it's a very very conscious um, decision that some people make to say, oh, I'm going to go back and work. Uh, I know I met a lady, she was a lawyer and she went back to a firm, but she'd worked there 10 years before and we were chatting about it and saying, well, you're different, they're different, <laughs> some of the law is different, you know, like this. and she said, yeah, it's actually really great and it was great before but it's very different but it's still really good, you know, yeah. and, and the thing is she's known to them, their characters are known, you know, there's, there's lots of new people there as well, there's a new energy um, we're in different times. So I think, yeah, exactly, Sonia, don't never say never. And I think that can sometimes mean like re circling back to things. And, and for me, that's a bit like me circling back to my dance. Like that was actually my first dream job. Oh, really? Yeah. To be when, a I was at, when, I, when I was at school, I was in a dance troupe and oh. um, through my dance school, yes. um, which was outside of, of school. But um, yeah, and it's amazing to get paid. I think I can't remember how much we got paid. I think it was like $20 a dance or something. And I was maybe in two or three. We do these corporate gigs and yes. things. But I also worked for Treasure Way, which I don't know if you remember I Treasure remember Way. Treasure Way. Yeah. So yes. I, you know, so I had my. My sort of, you know, my retail casual job yeah. where I had to break up fights in the Manchester department <laughs> at sale time and things like that, you know, <laughs> so like the bouncer of Manchester. And then I'd have my dance career, which is very glamorous. So it's kind of fun to, to think back of that and say, wow, you know, I got a chance to do those sorts of things early. So I think, you know, with your young people try and test things out, mm. but in a way, don't lose that when you're more mature and that at the other end. I think it's a time to rediscover. It's a time to experiment and find people who can support you on the journey whether that's like me doing that deep dive or or mentors or just people that you can hang out with or join a meetup group or you know whatever it is it's yeah. really important but what is really interesting to me and I've just recently read a book called A Fraction Stronger by Mark Berridge fantastic oh, book and I'm going to be that on my list. I'm going to be having a smart conversation with Hart in here, with um, Mark in Great. time to come as well and he had to reinvent himself after a cycle a very serious cycling accident and so it's and he writes about, and I've got a, a good friend who's also recently said the same thing, so it's interesting how, you know, sort of things start to echo when you, you're on a path, that he needed to find the new him. So yes. there's so much of our own identities which are often wrapped up in our professional lives and trying to extricate who we are outside of our work titles is sometimes really difficult. Definitely. And when you are not able to go back to that work title, having to find who the new you is and embracing a whole new person because, you know, you're not identifying with the title anymore yep. is a really big thing for people. Yeah, it can be very scary and I guess that's why we, we said earlier the, the tricky transitions but also being willing to, to look at yourself that way and be open and then be curious and explore and then start testing. And a lot of the time I find my clients are very fixated on the what, like what am I going to do yes. next? And absolutely that's why they often engage me. But we do look beyond that to the who, um, not not the rock band, not but um, <laughs> but the who of... Now that's really dating us, <laughs> Lois. We don't know who the who it. is. Who's no, the who? No, no, that's probably my parents' generation, <laughs> I'm sure. But the who around who's going to be on walking this path with me or who can be a mentor, who can support me, who can I support, you know. So really the networks and the connections and the relationships and people that have worked for quite a number of decades have an amazing 
treasure trove of wonderful people around them, sometimes they have lost contact. And, and again, that's where things like LinkedIn or, or engaging with your professional associations or exploring new ones or going to things and showing up, showing up in the world. Showing up and yeah. reaching out. It, it's sort of coming back into a vulnerable state, mm-hmm. but it's so important in order to reinvent, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you know, when we were talking about tricky transitions and age before, you know, I was I was fortunate to be awarded a Churchill Fellowship. Yes. Yeah, yeah we talk about in 2019, that. and and it was really lovely because I've had a couple of people reach out to me because that was mentioned on LinkedIn, and in you know, and, and open up about their experiences with cancer, and then saying, "Wow, well, you know, I've suddenly had this diagnosis, and then having to really look at my work, um, maybe pulling back time wise while I have treatment, and then some of them saying, actually, I don't know if I want to go back to that anymore." Mm. So tell us about that Churchill Fellowship, please, um, Lois, because it is something that I did want to explore with you and find out more about. Sure, yeah. Because um, you've got a wonderful report that you've done that's on your website, which we'll put a link to. And it's also on the the Churchill um, Churchill Trust website too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, um, I mean, it was a funny thing. I I knew about the Churchill Fellowship. uh, I can't remember when I first came across it, but I was aware of it and went along to an information session and kind of thought, oh, and, you know... Saw a few people that walked in and thought, oh, gosh, you know, a bit of imposter syndrome probably kicked in at that point and thought, oh, you know, I'm not sure if I have a topic really yet. But I was very lucky to work for a little while with um, Red Kite. I was one of the first career practitioners around Australia to start working with young people, 15 to 24 years old, who had a cancer diagnosis and then needed some support perhaps with study. Are they going to keep studying? Are they going to change study? work if they were working all of that sort of stuff so I was called an education and career support consultant in that in that role as part-time while I ran my practice at the same time and that was just an absolute privilege doing that job I absolutely loved it it such an honor the young people were just beautiful beautiful people to work with fun and challenging and yeah just everything it was just great so um that really gave me a bit of a fire in the belly around the fact that those services had had to sort of age out at some point as as not-for-profits have to do they have to sort of draw their line in the yes. sand and say this yeah. is funded up to this point up to this um, age of 25 or age of exactly 18 yeah really. and canteen now run that service um for, for young people yeah I guess I just thought wow what about 26 pluses and started researching that and I thought this is something that's happening around the world there's adult so you know career um, services for adults but there doesn't seem to be anything dedicated in Australia so that's what I decided to do I um I actually did apply and then my second go at it I got it so <laughs> timing Timing being what it was, that meant 2019 I was awarded and then, of course, I was going to go in 2020 and then, of course, COVID uh, reared its head and Did and so. that didn't happen. And, you know, the Churchill Trust was very generous with that cohort and the following cohort to say, look, you know, you can wait and you can wait. And and I could sort of see this was this was going on and on and on, the pandemic, you know, yes. I kind of almost had, didn't exactly have the crystal ball, but I thought this is not looking like a quick thing to me and this is important work. So just taking a step back, yep. that the the Churchill Fellowship is is a really prestigious um, award or scholarship program for people to around the world to submit a study area and, and go on a sabbatical, which is funded by the Churchill by the Trust. Trust. Yeah, that's Correct. right. Yes. And it often takes you around the world because that's the idea of connecting ideas around the world in the topic that you're looking to research. That's right. Yes. It, the slogan is to learn globally and inspire locally. So Perfect. it's about learning from others, usually you know, overseas, and then bringing that knowledge back and applying it in Australia. So I had been to all the places I was going to travel to by virtue of previous travel. Still would have been an amazing thing to yeah. do it in person. Because you would have had a real purpose for going yeah, and yeah. very focused. Yeah. What I decided to do was do it virtually, which was on offer, and I met some amazing people. I had some very long late-night conversations. Because of and, the time difference. And, you know, recording them on Zoom and then using Otter to translate and then oh, diving through all the yeah. information and reading stuff and watching things and being on conferences and stuff like that. So I had a great experience and immersion of it. Um, so which countries did you engage so, with? So uh, um, New Zealand, USA, Canada and England and Scotland right. which 
which yeah was lovely to talk with Beats and Cancer Charity in mm. Scotland and and their representatives. Um, it's really really great. So so I learned different things from all of them, and it was interesting to see that the model of deliveries were different in every case. And these were models of delivery for support, employment Career services. support. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and actually even even the scope was very mm. different. Some were very psychosocial support, quite holistic and and wide. And then others were very, I guess, you know, targeted support that was something like a resume review and then resources you could download and then conferences and supported, you know, seminars and things like that. Um, So some of it was a little bit closer and one-on-one in small groups and other others was a bit more resource-based. And was this all for young people who were following cancer, looking to engage in the workplace, or was it all ages? Um, it was all ages, but yes. more more towards the adult side because there are quite a few charities that operate globally that are dedicated to young people. Right, and there's, yes. there's conferences and there's, there's various um, in, interactions for young people. And when I say young people, I'm sort mm. of making 18 sort of young adults. Yeah, I think in, in, in a Australia, we have that sort of 15 to 24, 25, yeah. 20, you know, 26 seems to be the cutoff. Some some countries overseas take that up to 30. Right. But yeah, my, my intention certainly wasn't to cross over any services that, that Canteen now offer. It was to sort of when they end, you know, how mm. can we serve those people? So so that, that was an amazing experience. In the middle of all of that, I actually, I was off to a meeting and got a phone card, missed three calls from my GP. And went, oh dear, that doesn't look good. It's never a good thing. No, no. And I had a a little pink mole on the back of my leg that I thought, oh, I just added that onto the, you know, the shopping list that you go to your GP with. And I just said, oh, there's this funny looking thing. I was sort of on the back of my leg. I can't really even see it, but there it is. And that turned out to be a melanoma. So wow. so suddenly I was researching careers after cancer and I was self-employed. And suddenly I was looking up the resources for self-employed people and thinking, oh, this is actually, wow. yeah, so kind really of live very action personal, research. Yeah, a very personal twist. Yes, yes. Mm. So I had surgery for that and unfortunately it hadn't spread. And um, yeah, I had, you know, skin grafts and all sorts of things so I was I was sort of up in my bed <laughs> getting looked after in my turret as I call it I was yes. you know my meals were brought up to me and yeah it was an interesting time but it did make me think I wasn't on chemo or any of those extended things touch wood like like some of my colleagues and people that I met through that process but still it gave me that insight to go wow that could have been a lot worse but even yeah. when I couldn't really work that many days and most of my work em- empathy for yeah. the, the topic you were looking at definitely yeah. yeah so even sitting upright and leaning into the screen as I work with mm. people and that that hurt you know that was yeah. quite hard to do so I really felt for people who don't have much leave or work you know in certain industries where that's that's difficult so it did give me those insights so yeah so I'm now at this phase of published the paper and that's on the Churchill Trust website and then now just looking and having some conversations with people yeah. and, and looking at my next steps for that but I do want to help people especially those who decide they want something more like they've gone through that experience and as a result they want to look at what's their next what's their next so they're another yeah. tricky transition it is, isn't it? <laughs> yep. so in your report you say that in australia each year 39 percent of 144,000 pe- people diagnosed with cancer are aged 25 to 65 yeah, which years. is the cohort i was sort of looking yeah. at yeah and yet there are no dedicated comprehensive cancer specific career services for these adults yes so what were some of the recommendations that you mm. came up with through your report yeah i think some of the key things were definitely about having a resource that's australian because mm-hmm. there's a lot of really really good resources out there but when you're talking employment and employment laws and and services that are available obviously it doesn't apply to in a lot Australia, of people in yeah. Australia. Mm. And, you know, there is some information, but it's mainly like a, a fairly brief or like a, um, a, an e-book or a brochure and that sort of thing. So definitely having some resources or services that people can go to, but also ultimately some support that people can get either one-on-one or in group, but supported. And, and that's stuff I do in my practice. So I'm kind of looking yeah. at, yeah, how can I help? I did come up with recommendation of looking at collaborations and, and working in, there's a, there's many good cancer charities already. It wasn't necessarily my intention to start a ch- another, yet no. another charity. It was, it was about helping resource the ones that are already out there that do great psychosocial support, but maybe haven't looked at this area before. Mm. So I'm, I'm having some discussions in that, in that guise to do that, but also collaboration and with 
a multidisciplinary approach. And one of the things that came out of my research and, and discussions with people was it was amazing that the people from HR came from one perspective and the yes. people that came from the psych came from that perspective and then everyone's got their slant on it, which is great and it was it, you know, it's diverse. But I think, yeah, we can we can do so much more if we pull together than sort of stand in our corner defending our corner so my personal interest with this for what I'll most likely add value to this area is the people who say I want a different next but I don't know what that is because that's my sort of sweet spot in terms of what I really like helping people with so yeah so it's very exciting and I'm kind of it's almost like I did the virtual journey and now I'm kind of um, I'm doing a new new journey of discovery and talking with people but I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space and a lot of ways I can contribute and and join with other people so if you're listening and you want to contribute or you know get in touch please do oh that's exciting so it sounds like a new next for you as well yeah it is a bit yeah it's it's, it's another it's almost like rings of bark on the tree I think for me there's always the core but there's all these new areas and you know and in in some ways when we talk about those tricky transitions there's so many of those in different guises you know we've talked a little bit about about mums returning or people Mm. getting to the the zeros and the 50 (laughs) as a special one or having Um, to step out like I did to support my mum through you know some health issues and and there's just like I was saying the subtext of a person's career resume is far more interesting sometimes than the work (laughs) that they've done Yes, exactly. And, you know, I think everyone's journey is unique and that's why it can be a bit tricky in this space because I think the more personalised you go, the more impact you can have, yet the scope to help many, many people, you know, that that's the tricky part to look at. But I hope there's probably room for hybrid there is. offers and hybrid services. So that's, that's what I'm keen to explore a bit more as well. Lois, now to your warm table. You did mention earlier in our chat that your husband has perfected a Tuscan chicken recipe. That is correct, yes. Mm. That gets rolled out on very special occasions. Um, but that, that's beautiful. And that was from our big trip that we did overseas. And we were in this little villa in Barga in Tuscany. And Ed created this dish. I'm not quite sure what caused him to, but it probably was just because we were loving the He's countryside. Inspired. He was inspired. Yeah. So so I'm very, very fortunate because, as I say, pots of soup's about my length of things. Or <laughs> You're not the chef at home. I'm definitely not the chef at home. So our warm table, yeah, fortunately, yeah, there's this one person in the house that's, you know, ha- happy to contribute to that and others that help for help a little bit as well. But it's funny, actually, when you think of the table and the things that get dumped there, for, you know, mm-hmm. during the day and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And I think now my son hat tends you know, I have the, all these big hats now, of course, because I'm extra careful in the sun. And so there's, yes. all, there's all sorts of things that get moved around. But it's interesting. I love your concept. I love I love the warm table. And it, it had it caused me to reflect on the fact that in some ways in our little family, so there's um, the three of us, that our little dog, and sadly she passed fairly recently, our little dog Zoe, she's almost like the warm table because mm. um, like the four legs and, the, and, and wherever she was in the house, we would all gravitate towards her. She'd be in the middle middle we'd all you know and we'd oh. be chatting and she'd be always the center of attention yes. and you know getting getting cuddles and things like that so so it's interesting that that that's almost our little warm table is is the dog so we're feeling a little bit yeah you know sad at the moment because we don't have no her that's around. really very de- yeah. very sad and and you know again there's been so much research about the loss of a pet yes, is huge equally yep. as significant as the loss of a family member yeah. in some cases even more so <laughs> for people yeah yeah and yeah. definitely we you know definitely called her a family member yeah, you know that's, that's what I'm we would so do sorry. so yeah so yeah that's been tough but thank you and yep at some point soonish, we will uh, have a new addition to the family uh, with four legs. Yes, so, uh, you're yeah. going to be puppy parents again. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So that would be very exciting. But it is interesting how that warm table concept means so many different things to people. And, yes. Um, and I love your take on it. <laughs> I really do. Yeah. I mean, I definitely thought of food probably more so with my Scottish upbringing. Is mm. my parents always did? They call it brunch now, but I think back in the day, it was it was the the Scottish fry. Up oh, the Scottish fry on a Sunday up. morning, and that was just awesome. And it was even black pudding, which most people are probably going yuck at this moment in time listening to this. What's in a fry up? Tell us oh, that. Fry apart up. from black, yeah, black pudding, it's but... black pudding. It might have sausages, egg, 
Um, baked beans is definitely bacon. in there. Yeah, it can have the bacon. I think the thing that I really liked was the um, the Scottish drop scone. So effectively a pancake or a pike, yeah. what we pikelet. would call a pikelet. A pikelet, yeah, <laughs> with a good Australian I, I learned how to do that when I was Scottish. <laughs> coming, I came here when I was six. I had to put on this Aussie accent so people could even understand what I was saying. So a pikelet. <laughs> um, but a pikelet that was then like fried up again, you know, so it's really great for the arteries. But anyway, um, so that's sort of Scottish fry. So, so Ed kindly carries on that tradition oh, in our home now because cool. my parents always did it um yeah and whether we were in Scotland or we were here because we bounced around a little bit early in the early days and then we settled here um so the, the good old Scottish fry up not not usually any haggis in it that's that's just well, once that's a year thing probably a good thing but you do do that you do eat <laughs> yeah haggis, we do yeah. occasionally yeah mm-hmm. we've been to quite a few Scottish nights and burn suppers and things like that so yeah we keep the heritage alive a little bit but oh, we're, we're so definitely important. Aussies you know we're all naturalised Aussies. Yeah, yeah, but it's so important to keep those traditions alive yes. because they do just connect you with a whole different sense and memory and time, don't they? For sure. It's been such a pleasure to have you around my warm table. Thank you so much for, for dropping in and, and you came with beautiful biscuits, some um, some Scottish biscuits, some shortbread yes. and some Italian Florentine. So <laughs> you, you, you just, you've captured us both, which was just delightful. And thank and, you for the lemons. Oh, my pleasure, my <laughs> pleasure. It's been just a delight to sit and talk. Thank you for enlightening us on the fact that we can all have a next. If we get our yes. mindset right, we can actually have another another crack at a professional career which might look completely different to anything we've done in the past totally and congratulations on your Churchill Fellowship because that is an enormous achievement and what you have researched and pulled together for all of us to be able to grow and learn from and bring to Australia with your research is going to be really meaningful for people who have suffered from cancer and and actually then moved on into the next phase so Thank you for that too, Lois. I've really loved having you here to talk with today. Thank you, Sonia. It's been amazing. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to My Warm Table with Sonia Nolan. In Italian, a tavola calda is a warm and welcoming table where you can share big ideas, friendship, laughter and life. So much happens around the kitchen table and I wanted to amplify it here in this podcast. My aim is to feed your mind and soul through smart conversations with heart. No topic is off limits, but good table manners rule. I hope you'll join us each week as we set the table for my extraordinary guests who will let you feast on their deep knowledge, life experiences and wise insights. Let's keep the conversation flowing. Please subscribe to the My Warm Table podcast and share it with your friends and networks. Perhaps if they're new to podcasting, take a moment to show them how to download and subscribe so they don't miss an episode either. I'd also love you to join our community on Facebook. You'll find the group at My Warm Table Podcast. Your support is very much appreciated so that together we can eat, think and be merry.